Olá, boa noite a todos e todas. É um prazer imenso dar início a essa nossa última fala do ano de 2021 e receber o festejado professor Ralph Wilde aqui na nossa universidade. Uh, bom, eu pretendo então agora fazer uma breve introdução ao professor para que depois eu possa passar a palavra a ele e eu farei em inglês para que ele possa também nos acompanhar. So, good evening, Professor Ralph. Uh, it is a great honor and a pleasure to have you here at the Federal University of Uberlândia. Uh, unfortunately, we are online. Hopefully, one day we can receive you in person in our university. Um, nevertheless, I am sure our students will be enjoying a lot uh, from your lecture tonight. Professor Ralph Wilde is um, a professor at the University College of London. He's an expert in public international law, including international human rights law and the interface between international law and related disciplines, including international relations, history, legal and political theory, generally in critical feminist and post-colonial theory in particular. Professor uh, Ralph Wilde will be uh, lecturing us, lecturing to us tonight, and his uh, theme will be diplomatic asylum and extraterritorial non-refoulement, the foundational contribution of the Latin American region to extraterritorial human rights obligation. Professor Ralph, um, this lecture is um, also uh, supported by the International Law Association Brazilian branch, the study group from globalization, uh, development and uh, citizenship, and also our post-graduation program in laws, and also our law school. It is a great honor to have you here, and I will leave the floor now to you, sir. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Tatiana, uh, for this uh, very kind invitation uh, to give this lecture uh, to you and your, your law school. Uh, today. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, thank you. And also my great thanks to Natalia, um, who is in the background of organizing the practicalities uh, for this lecture. So um, hi, Natalia. Thank you for all your doing uh, with your help uh, uh, to facilitate this. Today I'm going to be presenting some of the main uh, arguments uh, from a forthcoming chapter that will be published in the Routledge Handbook on extraterritorial human rights obligations, which is due to be published uh, just in time for Christmas uh, on the 24th uh, of this month. Um, and I think um, uh, perhaps Natalia will be able to uh, share now the link uh, to that the publication. Uh, the, this is the website where um, the entire volume is being made available open access um, for your um, festive reading, um, starting from the 24th, um, you should on, on that webpage be able to access all the, uh, um, the contributions there. Mine uh, is um, uh, included and focuses on uh, the topic of uh, diplomatic um, asylum. So diplomatic asylum, which of course is a state offering refuge in its diplomatic premises in a foreign state, to an individual requiring protection from that foreign state, as happened with Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, involves, in effect, the operation of the concept of non-refoulement. The idea that a state does not transfer an individual from its control to the space of another state, where there's a risk of human rights abuse in that space or in the consequences of its transfer, for example, the transfer on to um, other places. An obligation to this effect exists expressly in the Refugee and Torture Conventions and has been read into other human rights treaties. Now, as this concept is being invoked by a state in its embassy in a foreign country, it's necessarily extraterritorial as far as that state is concerned. 
Now, as far as ideas of extraterritorial protections operating in international human rights law is concerned, the story told by the predominantly European, Europe-based commentators is that this is a relatively recent area of normative development. The relevant jurisprudential authority crystallized long after the adoption of the early foundational international instruments, notably through the decisions under the European Convention on Human Rights, mostly from the 1990s onwards, with the main decisions about Northern Cyprus. But this story disregards important decisions of the Organization of American States, such as the 1999 COAR decision about the US invasion of Grenada, and also decisions by the UN Human Rights Committee about situations in Latin America, such as the 1981 Lopez Burgos and Chalibreti de Diego decisions concerning the kidnapping of individuals by Uruguay in Argentina and Brazil. More fundamentally, this account is only possible by adopting a siloed view of the subject matter coverage of international law, whereby human rights protections only exist in international human rights law. This exclusive focus paves the way for the following view, again, held prominently amongst Europe-based international lawyers. It is the European region, defined broadly, the castle of Europe, that made the most significant and well-developed contributions to the protection of human rights in international law. This is because of the relative significance accorded to the jurisprudence of the Council of Europe human rights mechanisms compared to the jurisprudence of other equivalent mechanisms, including the OAS bodies. The significance, according to this story, is not simply a matter of comparing the position within each regime. It's also because of a common assumption that the general approach taken in decisions made under one regime is potentially transferable to other regimes with similar norms. Through this transference, the European regime contributed to the international human rights law of jurisprudence generally. There has been a process of universalization from the particular, globalizing from the European region. Such a narrative has purchased in Europe, partly because it feeds into and reflects broader European tropes about European civilizational exceptionalism and the bringing of these exceptional European standards to other parts of the world through their transfer to other regional normative systems and or the globally applicable normative system. This in turn fits into the broad theory and practice of colonialism and post-colonialism, both generally and in its relationship to international law. Now there is much to challenge in the, this narrative of the exceptional contribution of European human rights law to a greater appreciation of other regimes of international human rights law. But there is a more fundamental challenge. If the focus moves out from human rights law to international law generally, and the Latin American practice of diplomatic asylum is viewed as a species of extraterritorial human rights protection, then things look different. Such a standpoint reveals this region, the Latin American region, grappling with the subject of extraterritorial human rights protections much earlier than the relatively recent sagas under the European human rights system. It is perhaps fitting then that the most complete treatment of the subject of extraterritorial monofumo by an international human rights body to date is that provided by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in its 2018 advisory opinion on asylum. The opinion was requested by Ecuador, prompted by the asylum situation. In it, the court addressed the subject holistically and, in terms of the legal regimes potentially in play, 
broadly. He reflected on the Latin American practice and associated treaties on diplomatic asylum, the question of whether the right to asylum in the Inter-American Declaration and Convention on Human Rights applied to extraterritorial diplomatic premises, the court held that it did not, and whether the separate but related obligation of non formal in the Inter-American Human Rights Instruments applied in such places. The court held that it did. The court drew widely on jurisprudence from other international human rights regimes, including the ECHR regime in its analysis. The broad ranging and comparative nature of this analysis is in sharp contrast to the narrower and more parochial approach taken in and some of the external characterizations of the three main decisions on extraterritorial norma formal applying the European Convention on Human Rights. In 2012, the Hersey decision of the European Court of Human Rights held that the norma formal type obligation in the European Convention and a separate provision prohibiting the collective expulsion of aliens in Protocol 4, Article 4, applied extraterritorially. In this case, to Italian maritime pushback of migrants outside Italian territorial waters, and it held that these obligations were violated. A common trope amongst European uh, human rights lawyers was to see this as a landmark, affirm landmark affirmation of the extraterritorial application of non-formal protection. The reaction was then to try to explore de novo some of the dilemmas and challenges the operation of such protection throws up. Such dilemmas and challenges were also raised in another case, al Sadoun. This concerned UK troops in Iraq handing individuals over to the Iraqi criminal justice system when there was a risk of the use of the death penalty. It related to the situation after the 2003 war in and subsequent occupation of Iraq. Certain authority had been transferred from the occupiers to Iraqi representatives. The continued UK military presence was subject to the agreement of those representatives. The case went through the English courts, applying the Strasbourg standards indirectly via the domestic UK law Human Rights Act. It ended up in Strasbourg, and two years before Hersey in 2010, the court found that a non-reformal type obligation was in operation and had been violated. Eight years before that, in 2004, the Court of Appeal of England and Wales applying the Human Rights Act considered individuals claiming refuge in the UK consulate in Melbourne in the B and others case. It held that a normal formal type obligation under the European Convention of Human Rights could potentially apply, but on the facts, the relevant test was not met, and so there was no violation. The dilemmas and challenges raised in the context of these cases, especially because of the findings of a violation and the decisions being made at Strasbourg in Alcidin and Hersey, included the following. How can states discharge a non formal obligation or an obligation of that type when they're acting extraterritorially, not within their own sovereign territories? What about the profoundly different circumstances that prevail, basis for their presence, and other obligations that may be in operation? Are they supposed to hold on to people? until the human rights situation in the place where the individual will be transferred to more generally improves? What if the nature of their presence extraterritorially is temporary? Should they somehow prolong this in order to ensure protection? Alternatively, should they transfer the individuals to some third location, including possibly their own territories, to ensure protection there? In either case, prolonging the extraterritorial presence or transferring the individual to a third location, what if these options are not practicable? 
and or are indeed objectionable. For example, if they are opposed by the foreign state in whose territory the state is acting. In our study, the UK government submitted that the continuance of the UK military presence in Iraq depended on agreement to this by the Iraqi authorities. And a factor in that agreement was whether or not the UK would hand over the suspects in question to those authorities. Put differently, the UK's ability to continue to detain the suspects rather than hand them over to the local authorities was dependent on Iraqi agreement, and this would not be forthcoming. Thus, there was no realistic prospect of the UK obtaining Iraqi consent, enabling it to retain custody, whether indefinitely or even just until after the trial had been conducted and the question of whether the death penalty would be applied was determined. The UK also submitted that Iraq would not agree to the UK transferring the individuals to the UK for trial there. The European Court of Human Rights found that there had been a moment when the Iraqi side was reluctant to try the suspects, and that this provided an opportunity that the UK missed to seek a UK trial. A further related, ultimately determinative issue was whether the UK could have obtained an assurance from Iraq that it would not seek the death penalty in the trial of the suspects. This could have paved the way for a transfer compatible with the normal formal type obligation. The European Court held that certain opportunities to obtain such an assurance were not taken by the UK, and that in the absence of such an assurance, the transfer was in breach of the normal formal type obligation. Now, these decisions and associated commentary on extraterritorial law and formal under the European Convention of Human Rights typically address the dilemmas and challenges this concept throws up, as if they had not, for most of the last century, been played out in the Latin American region in its practice and associated treaties on diplomatic asylum. This practice and associated treaties are commonly understood in terms of a potential right on the part of the state to grant diplomatic asylum, not an obligation to do so. Nonetheless, the practice and treaties involve approaches to address some of the dilemmas raised by the provision of protection extraterritorially, which are relevant to circumstances where such provision is obligatory as a matter of human rights law. This is illustrated by the 1954 OAS Caracas Convention on Diplomatic Asylum. That treaty addresses one of these dilemmas, that the extraterritorial facilities like embassies or military bases can't serve as anything other than very short-term havens, but the extraterritorial state can't control whether and when the host state circumstances that necessitate refuge might improve. It therefore enables state safe passage to ports of exit to be accorded by the territorial state. This creates a potential bridge between extraterritorial protection in a foreign embassy and territorial protection by that same state or another foreign state, which has greater potential to be sustained for longer if needed. Had the situation at issue in Al Sadu not been treated as novel, but rather involving dilemmas concerning extraterritorial protection from non formal that have come up from time to time and therefore require forward planning, things might have been different. Some sort of equivalent workaround mechanism along the lines of the approaches reviewed by the European Court of Human Rights might have been given greater priority at the right time than the court held had been the case. And or such a mechanism might have had greater likelihood of being acceptable to Iraq than the UK claimed had been the case. 
The doctrine of misplaced European exceptionalism enables European lawyers and judges to heroically act as norm pioneers and problem solvers. It also enables those European states who resist the development of extraterritorial law reform or protection in human rights law as unrealistic and problematic to avoid having to reckon with how Latin American states faced up to the dilemmas and challenges involved and attempted to craft solutions such as in the Caracas Convention. And how they somehow managed to do this so long ago when international human rights law, even as a territorial proposition, was only just being established. To understand further how these links end up being ignored, it can be helpful to look more into the concept of diplomatic asylum in international law. And within this, to consider how the leading scholar globally of diplomatic law, Eileen Denza, treats the significance of the Latin American treaties and associated patterns. The provision of diplomatic asylum implicates international diplomatic law, in particular the law of diplomatic immunities and privileges. A key relevant norm is that the diplomatic premises of the foreign state are inviolable vis-a-vis -vis the authorities of the host state. The offer of diplomatic asylum exploits this to provide an individual protection from the authorities of the host state. International lawyers tend to suggest that this is unlawful in diplomatic law terms. The Latin American treaties providing for a right to grant diplomatic asylum in certain circumstances are regarded to be a compatible treaty-based derogation from this default position in diplomatic law insofar as the right is exercised in the territory of another party to the treaty. Thus, the right to grant diplomatic asylum on this basis is kept within the Latin American region. More significantly for wider purposes, Arlene Denzo suggests that states generally have what she calls a limited and temporary right in customary international law left intact by diplomatic law to provide protection as a matter of humanitarian protection, to use her words, in diplomatic premises, again using the words of Denza, at least where there is an immediate danger to the life or safety of the individual concerned, or again quoting Denza, where there is no prospect of his or her being given a fair trial on any charges by the authorities of the territorial state. So has the Latin American practice of providing diplomatic asylum and the various treaties on the topic adopted by states in the region providing for a right to do this played some role in the formation of this broader customary international law right? Well, Judge Alvarez, in his dissenting opinion in the 1950 asylum decision of the International Court of Justice, characterize these treaties as American international law. So did this American international law universalize to the global in the context of a right to provide diplomatic asylum? Just as European human rights jurisprudence has, it is claimed, universalized to the global in the context of human rights law generally. Well, a preliminary question is whether the practice and treaties in Latin America have constituted customary international law for that region. The predominant view, Judge Alvarez in the uh, asylum decision, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the 2018 advisory opinion, and I in Denza, is that it does not. Neither Judge Alvarez nor the Inter-American Court of Human Rights were concerned with the existence of a global norm of customary international law as well as a regional one. Denza, however, was, and in her writings, follows her rejection of a Latin American regional norm with an assertion that her limited and temporary right exists as a matter of global custom. On the one hand, then, 
The Latin American practice in treaty making on the subject has had no customary international law significance, even to Latin American states, let alone on a global level. On the other hand, somehow at the same time as this extensive regional practice in treaty making, but entirely disconnected from it, a global norm of customary international law has been in operation or has emerged on the subject. What then is the evidence for the existence of this global law? In her articulation of the norm, Denta offered citations to two dicta of the International Court of Justice in the asylum case, a case about two Latin American states, Colombia and Peru, and the application of a regional treaty on diplomatic asylum to those states. Assuming that Denza is correct about the meaning of these dicta on their own terms, an issue that I don't have time to go into here, more fundamentally, what is striking is that she's using the dicta as the sole authority for a proposition, for a rule of custom, that is somehow disconnected from the Latin American practice in treaty making on the subject. Even though the case the dicta is derived from is about such practice and treaty making. Ultimately, then, regional exceptionalism is deployed to block the potential contribution to the development of the global normative regime. This approach neatly complements and reinforces, while being based on a reversal of the underlying logic of exceptional narrative about the European contribution to the protection of human rights and international law. The Latin American practice of providing extraterritorial protection from normal law stayed in the region when it came to any normative significance beyond the region. And this was the case even when an equivalent norm entitling states to provide such protection was somehow regarded to be in existence at a global level, the generation and or sustaining of which one might have expected the regional practice to have had some bearing on. The European affirmation that there is an obligation to provide protection from reform or extraterritorially as a matter of human rights treaty law can then potentially affect a global shift. This shift can be viewed as a novel regional contribution to the general subject of extraterritorial protection from reform because of the dismissal that Latin American practice has global implications when it came to the supposedly already existing norm of custom international law. Moreover, the Latin American treaties cannot have a transferable effect in the same fashion as European human rights jurisprudence, because they're not part of a broader jurisprudential regime. Thus, ironically, because the Latin American region was so historically innovative in relation to this area of protection, developing it before human rights specific treaty law existed, the right to provide it, although not an obligation to do so, existed for the region in treaties that, unlike the later treaties that were the basis for the European developments, did not have the potential to be jurisprudentially linked to a global normative regime. When human rights treaty law then came along, there was not the same pressing need to explore the possibility of developing extraterritorial human rights obligations that might operate in diplomatic premises. There were already treaties on the topic, albeit only covering a right to provide us an asylum, not an obligation to do so. European innovation came partly then because unlike in Latin America, there was a complete absence of normative standards in this area, Denza's customary right with its mysterious origins notwithstanding. In Latin America, Individuals may not have had a right to effectively protection from extraterritorial reform or uh, uh, non-reform in uh, diplomatic premises, 
but states were sometimes willing to give them such protection. And crucially, arrangements were in place enabling them to do this without breaching diplomatic law. The latter was presumably not unconnected to the former. Whenever protection was forthcoming, the need for assistance from regional or international human rights bodies was reduced. And states wishing to provide protection didn't need the risk of violating their obligations to host states. Indeed, it's notable that the main contribution from within Latin American human rights jurisprudence to the topic came only when a Latin American state faced a situation outside the operation of the regional diplomatic asylum treaties, Ecuador in the UK. In this context, the state required normative guidance as to its position as a matter of the obligations it had in human rights law. An area of law which is not limited, as those treaties are, to situations arising in the context of its relations with certain other Latin American states. Europeans only got to innovate human rights law then because Latin American innovation on the underlying issue, extraterritorial human rights protection, had already happened decades earlier and addressed the matter to a certain extent, the provision of protection was discretionary, before human rights treaty even existed. If Dennis's account is correct, European states seemingly chose to forego aligning in some way with this approach as the basis for customary international, uh, customary international law rule, even as supposedly such a rule did exist or emerge for them on some other mysterious basis. And as a matter of the treaty-based equivalent, things would have to wait until much later. And when it came, it was through the very different, relatively precarious jurisprudential route of innovations in the interpretation of ambiguous treaty provisions by courts, rather than, as in Latin America, with states choosing to adopt specific treaties addressing the situation in express terms. Moreover, this happened on the basis of a big leap from the seeming absence of even being entitled to provide such protection to now having an obligation to do so. The abrupt nature of how this came about and the consequent treatment of the challenges it raises as novel are in sharp contrast to how the position in Latin America shifted more gradually from arrangements that provided a right to provide protection in asylum terms, the diplomatic asylum treaties, to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights' 2018 affirmation of an obligation to provide protection in normal formal terms. Indeed, this abrupt shift for ECHR contracting states seems also to have led to a backlash by some such states which in turn seems to have been accommodated in the 2020 MN decision by the European Court of Human Rights. In that decision, the court seemed to pull back on the scope of the extraterritorial application of the normal formal obligation, as it might operate in diplomatic premises, from what had seemingly been affirmed at Strasbourg in the M case and the English court in the B case. In doing this, it adopted arguments made in submissions to it by not only the respondent state, but also 11 other European intervening states. The MN decision and case concerns Syrian would be asylum seekers in a Belgian embassy in Lebanon who asked for a visa to travel to Belgium to claim asylum there. They argued that a denial of this visa would amount to the formal. The court rejected this, seeming to hold, in effect, that an obligation of normal formal cannot be off in operation in diplomatic premises, simply by virtue of the control exercised by the state over such premises through its operation of them. 
The Inter-American Court of Human Rights' advisory opinion two years earlier, by contrast, affirms the operation of the novel formal obli uh, obligation in diplomatic premises on a seemingly more general basis. So just as the Latin American region had adopted a right to provide diplomatic uh, protection earlier than other states, di diplomatic asylum, I, I think pardon, and including in Europe, now it's potentially firm an obligation to provide a protection for more for more in a broader set of circumstances in diplomatic premises than seems to be the position as a matter of the most recent European human rights law-based decision. It is important to appreciate, as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights did in its advisory opinion, that what are effectively human rights protections might exist in both diplomatic general international law and human rights law. Moreover, rejecting the intersection between these two areas of law also enables states to miss the link between the developments in the latter, which have affirmed an extraterritorial obligation of non formal and the situations covered by the former diplomatic premises. Indeed, the former coverage could be treated as if it's the only operative legal regime, with such situations therefore untouched by any requirements in human rights law. In turn, the provision of, of protection in diplomatic premises can then be framed as an abuse of diplomatic privileges. No account need be given to the idea that the state involved might be using its privileges to enable it to discharge its human rights obligations. Or, put differently, that it's the very existence of the diplomatic law privileges for example, concerning viability, that create the background conditions that put the state in a position to offer protection, which needs, therefore, to be provided precisely because of this capacity to do so. The Latin American identity of Ecuador foregrounds the significance of the tradition of states in this region for doing what that state did in Mother. At the same time, it may have been this very identity that enabled the situation to be viewed by some as somehow entirely disconnected from the developments on extraterritorial human rights obligations in European human rights law generally, and such obligations of non reformal in particular. The B decision had seemingly established the existence of the latter type of obligation in 2004, eight years before Assange entered the Ecuadorian embassy, as applicable to the UK in its diplomatic premises. But now that the shoot was on the other foot, and Ecuador was in the same position vis-a-vis -vis the UK that the UK had been in vis-a-vis -vis Australia in that case, the potential transferability of the normative position in human rights law that had been held to apply to the UK in B was not invoked. Here then, suddenly, the grand project of universalizing European norms on human rights ground to a halt. This suggests a project operating only when such norms transfer over to non-European others, here equitable without any secondary blowback implications for European states, here in the UK, as the host state that cannot have a sound transfer to its custody. Here, colonial echoes are evident. Of course, as we know, in the colonial era, European colonial powers saw themselves as bringing standards of civilization to non-civilized societies. But paradoxically, Whereas these standards were somehow understood to derive from European societies, they were not understood to apply to the relations between Europeans and colonial peoples. Such relations were, of course, characterized by mass murder, other atrocities, enslavement, genocide, and the plunder of land and resources. 
As I'll explain further, this link to colonial era job standards extends over to the wider issue at stake on this topic. Resistance to the extraterritorial application of human rights law as far as the UK and certain other European states are concerned. The insistence on two entirely mutually exclusive categories of diplomacy on the one hand and human rights protection on the other, of diplomatic law on the one hand and human rights law on the other, in the case of Sands in the Ecuadorian embassy, was tied up in a broader UK policy initiative. This is the state's ongoing campaign, supported by certain other states, to challenge the scope of the two key areas of human rights law that are implicated in this issue. Non or formal in general, territorial and extraterritorial, and the extraterritorial application of human rights law in general. The stakes are thus high. This link links things back to the context of us do. The UK was present in Iraq alongside the US because the two states had invaded, removed the government of, militarily occupied, and sought to transform the social, economic, legal, and political system in that country. Whereas the ostensible reason put forward for this related to weapons of mass destruction, the enterprise was commonly understood and indeed even partly justified as such by the leaders of the states of all as being concerned with removing a human rights abusing autocratic government and replacing it with a human rights protecting democratic regime. Yet when the issue arose of these two states being subject to human rights law standards themselves in the way they engaged in this enterprise, this was dismissed by them. The US has a long-standing position that human rights treaty obligations do not apply extraterritorially. When the UK position on the issue generally had to be addressed in the Alstain litigation, the state similarly refuted the capability on a range of grounds, challenging this all the way through protracted litigation in domestic courts and on to Strasbourg. An equivalent resistance standpoint and its litigation consequences was then repeated when it came to the non formal type obligation in particular in the al Sadin litigation. A further feature of colonial ideology and practice was the way that this was based on Orientalist racist notions of civilizational difference. Whereas these may have had some kind of legitimate purchase on various delusional traits of self identity when it came to Europeans, they of course had no legitimacy when it came to the position of the societies subject to European colonial domination. These notions enabled Europeans to overlook or downgrade the merit of the civilizations they were subjugated. The stakes were high because this process was necessary not only to justify the subjugation, but also to undergird the very societal self esteem of European societies and individuals themselves by ideas of civilizational superiority. In Osadu, this issue came to the fore because it implicated the human rights issue where Europeans are typically the most globally sanctimonious the death penalty. The extraterritorial application of the normal formal type obligation was implicated in the case only because the UK was bound by an international human rights law obligation prohibiting the death penalty, and Iraq was not. It was the very existence of divergent applicable human rights law standards that gave rise to the UK's obligation. The UK was caught between the rock of refuting the application of human rights standards to itself when it comes to the relations with people in other parts of the world, and the hard place of its commitment to promoting the application of such standards for such people against their own governments. A European state sees two cardinal principles of European colonial doctrine and their modern manifestation in European human rights promotion come up against each other. The effect of the position the UK took 
in the RCD litigation was to choose the former over the latter. The tables were then turned when it came to the situation in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. There, the UK was being itself in the role of the host state that seemingly had a lower commitment to human rights compared to the extraterritorial state, the reverse of the position it claimed for itself in Iraq. A non-European state was applying a higher standard of human rights protection that a European host state seemed to accept for itself when it faced the same situation in a different non-European context. Moreover, this standard was derived from norms understood partly to have been developed outside Europe. For this to be acceptable, Europeans would have had to have accepted that their position as a beacon of progressive human rights protection for the world was on shaky foundations. In offering protection to a sound there, Ecuador also intervened within a hugely contested debate amongst European states on extraterritorial, extraterritoriality and non-reform law and the intersection of the two. By example, a commitment to protections in this area which the UK itself, if faced by a similar situation, would wish to challenge. The problem for the UK then was that Ecuador was not only preventing the UK from doing what it wanted to do to Jimmy Sand. Also, Ecuador was acting in a way that suggests commitment to an obligation for itself, which the UK and certain other European states would seek to refute for themselves in equivalent circumstances. Put differently, the UK's rejection of the legality of Ecuador's action if grounded in a bypassing of any consideration of the potential relevance of human rights law, corresponds to the position it would want for itself as far as the extraterritorial application of human rights law is concerned. For the UK not to be bound by human rights law extraterritorially, or at least for the scope of extraterritorial capability to be highly attenuated, excluding, for example, a non-reformal element, necessarily requires a general position to be taken on human rights law, which renders Ecuador's actions lacking in legal foundation. The position Ecuador took was transgressive then, not only on a specific matter of what had happened to Assange. It also challenged the UK position on the very notion that states should have protective obligations in such contexts. And this was something which, if anything, was more of a concern to the UK as a potential bearer of such obligations in other contexts, i.e. playing the role performed by Ecuador, than being the host state in whose territory such obligations being applicable to other states would cause problems. Indeed, an economically privileged and militarily powerful state like the UK is much more used to being in a situation of acting outside its borders and having to respond to human rights challenges arising out of this, as in Iraq, than dealing with the human rights implications in its own territory of the actions of other states, although, of course, that has also arisen, for example, in the case of the, uh, the poisoning uh, of individuals in the UK uh, by Russian agents. That such a situation arose is due in, to the fact that the Assange situation occurred outside Latin America. A Latin American state sought to implement a Latin American approach to human rights protection outside its region and came up against the position seemingly rooted not only in a rejection of diplomatic asylum as a universal doctrine as a matter of general international law, but also sceptical of and resistant to the general project of extraterritorial human rights obligations, within which an equivalent obligation of extraterritorial law formal applied to diplomatic premises could be, and indeed had already been, situated. So to conclude, the Assange Ecuador Embassy saga implemented a much bigger set of issues 
with important historical resonances than simply what was at stake for Assange and all the matters implicated in his situation. It's a reminder that the extraterritorial protection of human rights in international law had its historical origins in the Latin or South American region, not, as Europeans tell themselves, in Europe. As the ECHR system seemed to catch up with the more long-standing Latin American norms of development concerning protection from non-formal extraterritoriality generally, it was a Latin American state which, through its own example, affirmed a commitment to these developments, albeit a commitment that didn't survive the change of government in that state, at the very time when they were under threat in Europe. With the Strasbourg court then seeming to give in to pressure and deciding to rein in the potential operation of an extraterritorial or a formal obligation in diplomatic premises in the MN decision of 2020, it's the 2018 advisory opinion of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that provides the most robust affirmation of the operation of such an obligation to date. Just then, as Latin America was the historical site of norm entrepreneurism on this subject, so too, much later, it was aptly a Latin American state acting in Europe, and then the Inter-American Court of Human Rights sending out a message from San Jose that served, in effect, to push back on the backlash against these norms as they have been adopted in the European system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ralph. Um, great, great conference. You gave us a lot of pointers on what we can think about um, not only diplomatic asylum, but also the roots of creating and possibly thinking about other forms of um, of the problems that it involves um, basically on this um, colonial foundations that we have in international law and um, if I may I, I I have some some pointers I, I would like to chat a bit with you uh, on this and um, if we could it would be great one thing that I um, that I would like to touch upon would be the fact uh, that uh, some authors, such as Professor Chimney in um, uh, in American uh, Society of International Law uh, number, uh, published an article concerning uh, customary international law and criticized customary international law in the view that. Uh, we do have international, customary international law, regional customary international law, and even local customary international law. And uh, it uh, talked about uh, possibly um, the, the cases, either the Aya de la Torre case that you mentioned in your conference, but also, for instance, when it comes to local custom, uh, it mentioned, he mentioned uh, the um, right of passage concerning Portugal and uh, India. And in this um, view, it seems that you and Professor Chimini dialogue in a, in a way, because both of you criticize these colonial foundations of customary international law, because in one side, we can see that uh, it is easy for uh, either Europeans or either practices arising from Europe to become uh, international customary rules, but when it comes for um, regional custom or Latin American countries or global South countries, it seems that we also uh, we, we have uh, some problems when it comes to creating a customary rule. Uh, perhaps um, we would have to have much more practice and a consolidation for even this rule to be considered as a regional customary rule when compared to the global north and practices from the global north and um i know that your lecture it, it surrounds this idea and it highlights the importance of the inter-american court of human rights 
uh, precisely on this um, advisory opinion of 2018, advisory opinion number 25, which considered actually um, asylum as a human right. And the impact of this decision, uh, it seems that it did not cross borders as much. Uh, it seems because uh, there are still a lot of authors, um, international lawyers, who defend that uh, if we are talking about refugee law, it would be a human right. But when it comes to asylum, it would be a right of, its, of the state to granting it. And this um, echoes so much this colonial foundation, as you put, that it, 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 my question would be first, if you believe that um, maybe we should rethink these ideas of how customary international laws uh, should be um, created or even uh, practiced and highlighted maybe if there was a way that we could uh, uh, go around these problems of creating customary rules, um, then it would be something to think about. And you brought this European Court of Human Rights bringing the fact of uh, the humanitarian aspect and this was something that was already present in this advisory opinion of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but no mention to it uh, was actually made. And I, I think, okay, so maybe Europe is not giving the credits to the Inter-American Court as it should. I'm not sure if you agree with me on that or not. So this would be something I would like you to hear a little bit um, from you, a little bit more, actually. And another thing that uh, it strikes me in your, um, positively, positively strikes me on your lecture would be that um, this idea of granting uh, an extraterritorial application of non refoulement because normally we think that uh, a general idea or a, a global north view would be that uh, this idea of uh, granting protection in an embassy abroad would actually have an impact on the idea um, of sovereignty or even respecting um, territorial rights of other states. And this becomes actually a problem when it comes to the impact that these restrictions of not granting humanitarian asylum could cause or uh, political uh, asylum in diplomatic um, uh, premises basically because uh, we are contradicting this uh, humanitarian view or these human rights obligations in respect to the individual. And um, we see that this non-intervention rule on the other side uh, may be causing some troubles. So uh, in this view, I would like to uh, hear a little bit more about your um, opinion on these uh, two sides of uh, of, of an apple or of an orange or of a coin, right? From one side, we have this humanitarian concern and from the other, we have this non-intervention rule that uh, is very much present in this sovereignty, uh, which was created in 1648 in this global North perspective and this colonial um, uh, roots. So this would be contradicting. And if we could chat a little bit more on these topics, it would be amazing actually wow well thank you so much Tatiana for, for a really um, uh, insightful uh, uh, and, and nuanced um, observations on um, um, that, you, that you are engaging with my ideas um, so so carefully and thank you um, it's clear you've obviously read the chapter that I, that I sent you on so I really touched by that thank you um, so I think the states are really high in a way because you know, you mentioned Tim Lee's article, which is which I would recommend to, to everyone. Uh, as uh, any anyone who wants to understand customary international law and and the very important questions we have to ask about the, the legitimacy of the, of the very way in which we understand the existence of normativity internationally and on on what that based on what that is. What that is based on, um, uh, and I think as you as you identify, what I've tried to do in in, in this work has 
explored that theme through the particular case study of this concept of diplomatic asylum and how it relates to extraterritorial human rights protection. And what I was what I found so striking, I mean, in a way, the asylum decision of the International Court of Justice was was limited to the question of regional custom rights. So okay, they conclude that there isn't there isn't custom from the treaties, but you know, it is only limited to to a consideration of the existence of a regional um, custom law. What I was really struck by was this reading then this up this argument put forward by um Eileen Benzo, who, who is regarded to be you know to be the, the, the global authority on international diplomatic law. And I read very closely everything that she's written on this topic in various different places. And it was striking that this insistence on dismissing the idea that there could be any globally significant um, take out from that regional practice. Because, of course, it's not just the existence of the treaties, right? The treaties were then implemented and followed, and, and protection was provided pursuant to this treaty, right? So, uh, you, the, that very conventional doctrinal custom international law analysis would therefore require a, a detailed survey of that practice, uh, uh, you know. And in a way, because the, the, the ICJ dismissed that as having regional um, significance for custom, that's, that gives a kind of excuse for then it to, of course, because if it can't have regional significance, then, then that's the end of the issue, right? It wouldn't be global if it didn't even have regional significance. But then, okay, but, but then for her simultaneously to argue that there is in fact a global, um, somehow a, a general humanitarian right to do this, um, which is conjured out of seemingly no consideration of any practice, and yet it rests on oddly dicta from this decision. <laughs> so it's striking the, the lengths to which someone will go to, to dismiss the possibility that this Latin American practice can have global significance while at the, simultaneously insisting on the existence of a global norm which could only exist uh, if that practice and uh, associated opinion was had some kind of normative weight. Um, and I think that demonstrates perhaps what is at stake for Europeans in having to shift radically the, the, the orientation uh, that is adopted when it comes to um, uh, uh, an understanding of normativity that, that isn't Eurocentric. And um, I think what I tried to do in this chapter is is, 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 is indicate how um, very much from, as it were, a conventional doctrine standpoint, how, how difficult it is um, to, to maintain that. Or rather how it can only be maintained through through a, a distorted, self-actualizing project about European significance and exceptions. And then, of course, it makes sense. Uh, but it, it actually doesn't make sense according to the very conventional doctrinal approaches to jurisprudence that, that is supposedly being followed, which is a different critique for, of custom or custom information than, say, some of the other also very important critiques, which are that the very doctrinal methodology itself is problematic, right? So the very idea, for example, of treating all states as in an equivalent material position to be able to notice developments and, and register protests or register support um, is, of course, um, effectively a methodology which um, enables better resource states to have a greater influence 
in the formation of custom. Um, and, and that therefore that ostensibly objective neutral universal process is actually embedded within it, obviously it is. Um, uh, it, it presupposes uh, something which isn't the case, which is that all states are in an equal position to be able to, to get, have a, uh, an input into the lawmaking process. Your second point about the two sides of of the issue, so the um, Perhaps you could just repeat that, Tatiana. So, what, what, what it is? So, so, the idea of the, this protection in diplomatic premises being transgressive of the obligation to observe state sovereignty is that is that. The so the general idea when we talk about um, granting someone asylum at the diplomatic premises would be that this idea would actually be an infringement in the global north um, of the sovereignty of that state or even the rule of non-intervention. But on the other side, we have this, uh, nowadays, this current humanitarian concern and these uh, human rights obligations in respect to the individual that um, flourish and are uh, repetitively um, secured under international law and even by the international uh, by the european court of Ju the european court of human rights the inter-american court of human rights and it seems to me that um the idea of granting um asylum to someone in diplomatic premises i totally agree with your idea that this is an extraterritorial obligation and that we should uh, build on that based on the developments made not only by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2018, but also um, these other developments. But nevertheless, we still have these foundational roots in interna international law, this uh, based on 1648, that still um, shout to the idea of uh, sovereignty and we need to... Uh, so, so this would be how to challenge that, because you challenge that in your in your in your newest piece that you were uh, talking to us today but uh, in, in practice how how can one challenge that this mm. contradiction posed by colonial um roles and and uh, roots of international law i think what's what one thing that comes to mind is we think about the um the operation of diplomatic embassies and even military bases, although they perhaps have fallen into this separate category I'm about to, to the folk, they are operating on the basis of the consent of their state and the idea that they have this um, inviolability is something which is regarded as acceptable for the purposes of um, enabling the conduct of diplomatic relations and of course it also operates reciprocally reciprocally so this so of course a state has to give this to other states of its own territory but it gets the same privileges itself in its premises in in foreign states so there is a sense of neutrality about the uh, the arrangement then having this concept of human rights protection somehow operating within these diplomatic premises disrupts that arrangement. Um, if the protection is from the host state within which the diplomatic premises are located. And it, it transforms the um, it transforms the embassy into a different uh, to perform a different function. And one can see this in other extraterritorial contexts, right, where an extraterritorial arrangement introduced for one purpose has been transformed into something else. So for example, the use of um, military bases by the US, converting them into detention and interrogation facilities in the, the war on terror period that of course we're thinking about in terms of its 20 year anniversary uh, recently. Um, so again, the normative transformation of, of um, uh, an extraterritorial site, the embassy or the military base, to perform a very different function 
uh, than, uh, than it was originally uh, set up to perform, and perhaps was the reason why the host state agreed to have it there in the first place. Um, and but then it's important, it is important to acknowledge that this is happening in both those situations, right? So it's not just the case that it's happening. I mean, it's, an, it's, it's, it's very unusual for diplomatic asylum to be, to be offered in diplomatic premises. It is somewhat more commonplace for US uh, uh, military bases to be, to be used for this other purpose. So, we are in the arena more generally of these arrangements moving away from an exclusive association with a particular reason that, that, that legitimated their creation and legitimated the special regime of the uses and privileges that applies to them and enables then these activities to happen. Either enables human rights protection in the front form of diplomatic assignment or enables human rights violation in the case of repurposing parts of military bases for the use of uh, uh, detention and interrogation of horse uh, torture uh, and, and being part of the extraordinary rendition um, uh, network. That links, on, I suppose, to the broader issue, which is the, the extraterritorial application of human rights law, of course, emerged in the context of um, activities that were themselves, in and of themselves, regarded to be um, either illegal, like, for example, the invasion and occupation of Iraq, or at least of questionable legitimacy. And many extraterritorial activities that then become subject to human rights law regulation are themselves regarded to be of questionable legality and legitimacy often. And so the human rights regulation of them has to be seen as part of a more general discourse of, of, of questioning the legitimacy of the need for accountability, which is of a very different kind than the idea that human rights standards should operate within diplomatic premises, which are generally understood not to be initiated and established in any sort of illegitimate way, in, in, part, in, in fact, quite the reverse. So I think the context is very different, that this jurisprudence has, to a certain extent, it, it developed in the context of activities that have, of their nature, been violative of human rights in various ways, and then transfers over to um, other situations where there's nothing necessarily inherent about the operation of diplomatic premises that would necessarily involve uh, human rights violations. Uh, it just is something that might occur if particular circumstances take place there, um, or things that can be done there which may involve human rights protection or not. So, what's significant perhaps is to think about um, the different contexts in which these norms have developed, even if the norms themselves, um, in some respects, are in common. That operate that, and uh, the, the nature of the obligations is, is, is similar, non formal, or something equivalent, and extraterritorial. But then, in other respects, actually, the extraterritorial context is, is profoundly different. That's so interesting because. Um we see an evolution in one sense of the extraterritorial application of human rights by the European Court of Human Rights in um, 10 years uh, ago from uh, until today. And we see um, also a lot of opportunities for the European Court of Human Rights to talk about it and to impose some, some uh, patterns of human rights uh, applications, even extraterritorially, but sometimes it seems to me that the European Court of Human Rights doesn't want to go along with what is being argued based on the margin of appreciation theory. And sometimes it seems to me that the margin of appreciation 
um, becomes also a problem when it comes to defending uh, or even trying to um, bring about more discussions on certain topics, such as diplomatic asylum. It seems to me that sometimes um, the margin of appreciation theory, it um, impedes even uh, or prohibits even the evolution idea <laughs> that we are trying to question under international law. And we have here, at, it seems to me, an example in diplomatic asylum, but there are many other examples. Uh, and, and you touched upon one, which is uh, more general on a global war on terrorism. And it seems to me that it, it's still a problem maybe of the European Court of Human Rights to, to try to evolve. And at least in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, every time a country um, tried to evoke the margin of appreciation, uh, the court rejected it. So it seems to me that these differences that you just mentioned, they are quite essential and they're quite particular. Sometimes it seems to me that also these uh, differences when it comes to this theory, it also helps highlighting the differences between the interpretations and the views that we see in asylum law. I, I'm, I'm not sure if you agree with me or not on that. I'm, I'm sorry if I am um, trying to, to get more of you, but I just love the topic and you touched upon on, on various uh, points that we are always discussing and I am really thrilled, so. so well, thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm, I'm really, it's fantastic to, to, to have this conversation with you. Uh, and I think what, what uh, the link I would make with the margin, is with the, you know, the margin of appreciation, which is of course an inventory doctrine, you know, it's not, it's not part of the European rights. So it's prudentially developed doctrine of deference or tell you what, how one might um, describe it. Um, with extraterritoriality, they don't need to invoke the margin because defining the scope of applicability itself ends up limiting what the what will be covered by human rights law. Right? So instead so the margin is used where you have a situation where the court says yes, the law applies here, and we're and we're going to review it. And there's this standard, and there are these facts, and we're going to apply this this standard to these facts and determine is there a violation or not. But we're going to give the state a certain degree of a margin of appreciation, and we do that. So, you know, kind of the various ways of describing this, we're going to, to a certain extent, defer to the state's own determination of whether or not this action is justified or not. I mean, I'm, I'm, putting my crude way of summarizing what is going on there jurisprudentially. With, with extraterritorial applicability, the court can achieve the same ends, but through different means. The need, by saying, the law doesn't apply. Right, so there's a test of applicability. So this state is doing something extraterritorially as a matter of fact, right? But the question then is, is it covered by the law? Does the law even apply to it? And so applicability becomes the mechanism whereby the court does what it would do in another context through the margin, which is essentially to establish the boundaries of where it will become involved and where it won't. And this is through the notion of effective control and how that effective control is defined, right? So if there is this effective control, however, that is jurisprudentially defined. And if that test is met, human rights law apply. If it's not, they don't. Even if the state is acting extraterritorially as a matter of fact, and even if that action has an impact on human rights, it doesn't meet the control threshold. Therefore, human rights law doesn't apply to it. Therefore, there's, there's no review from a human rights law. And a, rather like with the margin, that on all of the jurisprudence on the margin of appreciation, what you see is a, a difference of view being taken on the meaning of that extraterritorial control trigger and a, a shift in that over time. And you mentioned 10 years, and if you go back 20 years on the Bankovich decision, 
the European Court of Human Rights. And then the, the sort of 10 ish years later with the Alskani decisions and subsequent decisions, you, there seems the, the, the same test seems to be a, applied in a broader way to cover a broader set of circumstances. But then in the most recent decisions earlier this year, um, uh, um, I, 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 it seems to have been, they seem to be coming back. And what has been, it, it, we have to, of course, situate these jurisprudential shifts in the broader political context. So the beginning, uh, the Bankovic decision when the attacks on 9 11 had just happened, and there was a sense, uh, um, this exceptional moment of global sympathy and understanding for the position of the US and a, 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 the view taken that probably there was going to be some form of action by the US in response and the European Court making a decision about another situation having to issue a judgment that might have a precedent for that kind of future situations potentially being concerned that it, it would if it adopted a broader test of applicability that it would find itself reviewing what was going to happen in Afghanistan. Ten years later, well into the war of terror period, where these concerns about extraterritorial human rights violations have become much more prominent. We've had Abu Ghraib, we've had the, 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 uh, uh, Guantanamo, uh, extraordinary rendition, secret CIA black sites, and the court, therefore, the same court applying the same test, potentially in a broader, to cover a broader set of circumstances, arguably being um, bolder, or at least feeling somehow more um, safe, on safer ground, asserting uh, the need for accountability. Jump forward another 10 years, in the context of the backlash amongst some European states uh, to supranational human rights protection and a particular resistance to its, the jurisprudence on extraterritoriality, the court pulling that. Um, and so I think that links have to be made between these jurisprudential developments that are happening in different in different areas, um, but, but which may be um, reflective of common uh, 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 trends. The, the common trend of the general problematic of international human rights law enforcement, which is how international mechanisms see themselves being able to discharge their functions when they are in a precarious position and the continued support for them on the part of states is not something that they can take for granted. And that they have to somehow seek to engage in meaningful review while at the same time maintaining their continued existence and relevance. Amazing, because, uh, well, I have a lot on a lot to think about now um, precisely because uh, this idea of having um, this protection to grant someone asylum even abroad extraterritorially uh, would mean also um, an idea of extending the protection to one based on this humanitarian uh, ideas that um, it seems to me that at least in this um, various um, sentences that we have been seeing or uh, jurisprudence that sometimes is not even the focus at least in uh, the european court of human rights that's why I, I wanted to touch upon a little bit on this extraterritoriality uh, and um, the idea of the margin of appreciation but um natalia could you please uh, place uh, the image i would just like to highlight to everyone who um, is joining us 
that we uh, have this new uh, chapter of Professor Ralph, uh, which is based on this uh, lecture today, uh, Diplomatic Asylum and the uh, Extraterritorial non refoulement which will be out on December 24th. Um, and it's on this book and we have this uh, link in the image, but we also placed in the comments. So if you, you would like to uh, read more, we strongly um, suggest and advise um, the book. And um, at least from our part, we're so grateful for um, receiving and having you, Professor Ralph uh, Wildy today at our university. Um, you gave us a lot of uh, pointers for our next semester to think and to discuss about. And uh, it will be a pleasure um, to extend this um, chat uh, or to have you then back to Brazil and um, to discuss a little bit further on, on our uh, views on, on the topic. And thank you very much. I will um, like to say, uh, to everyone who is um, joining us, um, that the um, Lista de Presença is already on the chat. So if you'd like a certificate for attending this conference, you may just uh, click on the, the link and uh, fill in with your personal data. Uh, I will now uh, ask Professor Ralph if you'd like to have uh, some closing remarks. Well, just to say again um, uh, how delighted um, I've been to have this um, opportunity. It's so kind of you uh, to, to give me this opportunity to present my ideas. Um, and so to thank you again very much, uh, uh, Tatiana, for the kind invitation. And also again to uh, Natalia for all her great work um, behind the scenes um, enabling this event uh, to happen. So thank you again. Um, and I look forward to continuing these conversations um, with you, with everyone um, uh, who's been attending this. Please get in touch. It would be great to hear from you. Um, and um, yes, I look forward to, to carrying on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, uh, we conclude our um, seminar for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Professor Ralph, once more. We'll see you in 2022, everyone. Bye.